Everybody, I want to say hello and welcome you to the Center for Social Innovation. My name is Adil Dalla. I'm the Director of Culture here. And I'm going to be your informal and clearly very casual MC for the rest of this evening. There's this insatiable desire and vision and dream that we can collectively do better. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we've invited six individuals, all of whom are either CSI members or alumni, and we've asked them to share with you in three, three short minutes, what's one bold idea that you believe is going to happen in Toronto? What's something that you think must happen to make our city better? So I'm going to start with a story. Uh, last week, I was in Regent Park checking out the new park, and it was lunchtime, and next to me was a playground. And there were kids everywhere, going down the slide, on swings, and there was one kid that ran up to his friend, tagged him, and said, hey, you're it. And the other kid says to him, with a very concerned look on his face, like, no, I'm invisible. So the kid then says, all oh, right, catch you later. <laughs> What's amazing is how kids easily let go of their assumptions. And working out of CSI as a manager of CSI Region Park, I see the enormous transformation happening in a neighborhood going through a revitalization towards a mixed income uh, model from an insular social housing project that, ha that was the largest and biggest in North America. And the vision here is to create economic uh, viability, create social cohesion, create safety for the residents. But while I see amazing grassroots initiatives happening on the ground, I also get to witness some of the real tensions. Tensions based around assumptions and assumptions that become barriers among different groups. You have assumptions about the rich and the poor. You have assumptions about the newcomers with different cultures and different religions. You have assumptions about those who are being displaced, those who are new, those who are former residents who have came back. So how do we shed our assumptions so that, as people, we can really connect with one another, share, and take care of one another? So my old idea is to shift our perceptions. And by doing so, renew a sense of community. And it's a very simple idea. Imagine a one-day festival called The Playground, um, where everyone who lives and works in a particular neighborhood is invited to participate uh, in giving, in gifting to your community. Now, gifting is non-monetary, and it's whatever you wish. So imagine, on the day of this playground, you've got seniors telling you stories of how they came to Canada. You have a man who lives off the street playing the Play Me Piano in the middle of the park. You have a local school group who has a dance flash mob handing out pay afford compliments. You have an immigrant women's collective giving out samosas. And on this day, you have this unexpected interaction which help alter perceptions. And shared experience facilitates connectedness. And imagine playground popping up in different neighborhoods. And through these festivals, people are able to get to know one another, get to know your neighbor, and get to play with one another. And like the children that I saw running around in Regent Park last week, it gives us a safe space for us to have mutual goals in having fun and being ourselves, but more importantly, letting go of our assumptions. Thank you. So yeah, so suspend your beliefs and understandings of how we conduct participatory practices in planning. So my suggestion is that we should involve more arts-based uh, creative practices in how we do public planning and participatory uh, planning processes. So what the heck does that even mean? So an idea of that would be to think about how 
we're all very creative and tactile and innovative people and how can we start looking at city building in the same manner the same way that you might look at your organizations and start developing various ideas like how can you start bringing that to how we do uh, planning processes and so an idea I have is to create an actual mobile structure that you can hitch onto a bike you can hitch onto a car take that out into communities and actually break down some of the systemic barriers around how uh, participatory planning is done whether it's you know access to information or access to space or time or resources and bring that bring that sort of consultation and that engagement to the communities and to the street and sort of break down those processes and so looking at ways of reimagining how we talk to people in our communities and kind of bringing in more creative processes in that way. How am I doing on my time? <laughs> I'm good. So um, there's a lot of ways to do this. There's not just that idea of doing a mobile structure, but there's various other creative ways that you can start doing planning processes. And if you have other ideas, you can find me at the bar and we can definitely talk about them. Great. <laughs> OK, all right, here we go. Let's get this warmed up. How many people in this, in this room here ride a bicycle? You! Ah, yeah! All right, you're not alone. It turns out 54% of Torontonians ride a bike. Believe it. That's 1.5 million people. They've ridden a bike in the last year. The thing is <laughs> that 73% of Torontonians say what's holding them back from riding more, you guessed it, is a lack of bike infrastructure citywide. It's a huge issue. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten close to perhaps an incident with a motor vehicle. Yeah, all right, yeah, awesome. It sucks, right? We can do so much for our fellow Torontonians if we invest in building a city-wide grid of protected bike lanes. Um, Port Portland, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Portland, Oregon had been building um, painted bike lanes for about 20 years. Their mode share was about 7%. They were like, oh my gosh, why aren't we as good as Copenhagen? In the end, it turns out they went to, you know, to Portlandians and asked them directly. What they found was is that 62% of people will only ride on main streets on protected bike lanes. This is a huge issue. We've launched a campaign called the Minimum Grid. Um, we, we are calling on all politicians to invest in building the Minimum Grid by 2018. What I need everyone in this room to do is to get one of these gorgeous yellow bike ribbons from Mark right over here and put them on your bicycle tonight. Ride around with them until election day. Talk to your local councillors, all the candidates who are running, and ask them, do they support building the minimum grid? Finally, I need you to sign up for Cycle Toronto. We've got a sweet promo tonight. $10 gift card uh, you get for joining. So uh, the big idea, build the minimum grid by 2018. Thanks so much. <laughs> Yeah, I've been mulling over is uh, it's a pretty simple one. There are no infrastructure costs, no need for lengthy environmental assessments, and no digging up streets. It's all about changing the wording of uh, a few bylaws and policies. My idea is pretty simple. It's allow houses that contain apartments to be turned into condo corporations. Okay, mull on that one there. Okay, why? It comes down to, 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 ba to basic math here. The cost of living in Toronto is, is continued to rise, uh, so much so that even the, the middle class can't afford to actually uh, uh, own the place uh, that they live in. Um, so, uh, 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 so this is kind of personal for me. I, I, I've been, I've been uh, uh, living and renting uh, for about 17 years. Uh, uh, my partner and I, we now have a kid. Um, we want to live in the neighborhood that we live in. So our, our criteria is we don't want to own a car. It's too expensive and we don't like the environmental impact that it has. Uh, we want to live in a community where we can walk to most of our amenities. And that means that we must live in a neighborhood that is dense and very walkable. And uh, a house in those kind of neighborhoods um, is getting 
getting close to a million dollars, if not more than a million dollars. So if we wanted to buy a house in our hood, we, we, like, we couldn't afford it. We would have to team up with someone, um, let's say another couple, um, and you know, we would live in one apartment, they would live in another apartment, and maybe we would rent out the basement apartment to, to help make the, the mortgage. Um, the difference between uh, a house that's, say, a million dollars and a condo that is $300,000 is, is obviously very huge. Um, so uh, what I'm what I'm hopefully getting at here is that there's uh, enough uh, house. It's not about affordable housing, but housing affordability. It's this this whole swath, and I'm sure a lot of the people in this room would potentially like to own a place one day, but it's getting impossible. We're all going to have to move to Hamilton or something dire like that, right? Um, if we want to own a place, so I. I I like Hamilton. I don't want to move there. So uh, I would, but I would love to own the actual apartment that I live in right now. It's a nice uh, one in one bedroom place um, uh, that that would be perfect for for us. Um, and it would cost us somewhere in the range of maybe three hundred thousand dollars. So this is actually it's it's attainable at least. It may not be affordable for me right now, but at least it's attainable. Um, I know there's some uh, roadblocks. The, the, the roadblocks in this, and the reason why we can't do this in Toronto, but you can do it in Montreal. This is uh, this has happened in New York, uh, London, and Tokyo, um, is that simply that I, it costs $50,000 to turn a house into a condo corporation. Um, and it ha that house has to be owned by a larger uh, company with a, with a whole bunch of assets and insurance and those types of things. So this, this idea would mean that for a whole swath, even maybe a generation of people that live in this city, you would be able to own a house if they just changed a few words uh, uh, in the bylaws and the policies of the city of Toronto. I know there are some drawbacks uh, about, about this idea, but it would make housing affordable to a large portion of, of, of the city, which it's that can actually own right now. Uh, so tonight, what I'm going to talk about is a question that was actually asked earlier, which is who here lives or has ever lived vertically? And what I mean is a condo apartment. Okay, so more hands than I think I saw last time. Now, when you were living vertically, did you find that it was difficult to fit your entire life into about a thousand square feet? And if so, what, what was difficult? What did you have in your apartment, or what would you have liked to have in your apartment that you couldn't store? It was just taking up too much space. Bikes. Bikes, a bike, yes, okay. Tools. Tools, haha, <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, sure, vacuum cleaners, maybe folding tables, folding chairs, these kinds of things that you want to have sometimes, but you really just don't want to have to store or own them, have the expense of purchasing it, and yeah, really the storage is the big issue. So you might have a storage locker that you pay for, or you might have a lot of generous friends that you go and borrow a ladder from when you want to do some work and change your light bulb. Uh, so the idea is to have what I call a vertical living library start taking place in high rises in Toronto. How this would work is it'd be a room in a building. This could be an existing building or a new building that's built. You would go in there with your key fob or a key. There'd be a tablet there, so you say, okay, I'm going to check in this room, there'll be all kinds of things that you need once in a while that you don't want to own. It's not, not a toaster oven, but perhaps it's a large coffee maker if you want to have some people over, or a bartending kit, perhaps, that you just don't use that often. So you go down to the room, you pick up your bartending kit. I won't keep this too much close to my mouth. And then you has a has a digit number on it. You sign in, username, password. You type in the three-digit number on your uh, item that you want to borrow. It says, do you want instructions? You press yes. It'll send you email you instructions on how to use that tool or good uh, in the safest way possible. And then you use it, bring it back when you're done. What we do is we go and maintain those tools, make sure they're in good shape, make sure they're always clean and sanitized if they were kitchen items, and saves you the burden of ownership, saves you from having to store this stuff, and perhaps, if you're lucky, you get to meet some neighbors, because now that you're using the same stuff, you have more consideration for the people that live over, beside you, above you, below you, and that's my idea, Toronto. A lot of condos in the city, and I think we could do a lot better than 500 vacuum cleaners in a building. I think we could do five. Cheers. <laughs> I'm going to pitch an idea that I hope will happen in my lifetime, and I'm turning 40 on Saturday, so we're running out of time here, folks. Um, I would like to propose that we reclaim our public spaces in Toronto by getting rid of every single goddamn commercial billboard in this city. 
And some of you say, woo, and some of you are thinking, why? Who cares? Is that really an important issue? And I'm going to give you six reasons why it's an absolutely crucial issue to create a vibrant, creative, innovative city. Number one, the messages on billboards are completely void of anything meaningful or spiritual. The messages on every single one, buy more crap which is the last message we need to hear in this environmental crisis. Number two, our collective mental health. A lot of advertising campaigns are based on the idea of making you feel like crap about yourself and then offering a solution. You smell bad, your teeth aren't white enough, you're too fat, you're wearing the wrong clothes. Why would we want an industry committed to making you feel like shit decorate our public spaces? I say no. Number three. <laughs> There's a lot of beautiful things in the city, a lot of beautiful architecture, parks, clouds, trees. Every billboard blocks the view of what's behind it and robs us of hundreds of square miles of visual space. Number four, people need to have a sense of collective ownership on their city to participate, right? And the way that you decorate your homes, the way they've decorated this space makes you feel like it's your home. And if someone walked into your home and put up their own art, you wouldn't feel like it was your space. That's how billboards should make us feel, and they do. We lose our collective sense of ownership because every billboard is like a dog peeing on a fire hydrant. It's the private sector saying, psst, this is my space. And it's not, it's ours. Okay, number five, billboards are designed to distract drivers. It's insane. We're putting up flashing digital billboards on highways to distract drivers' attention away from the road. It's criminal. Number six, most important, we're very proud of the diversity in Toronto. Billboards do not reflect that. Almost all the models are white, they're all able-bodied, they're all straight, they don't show any indication of religion, they all have the same body shape. Fuck that, I'm angry. It's wrong when people look at the visual imagery in their own public spaces and don't see themselves reflected back, and we have to change it. But the innovative idea I'm proposing isn't about taking them down, it's about what we do instead. Imagine the blank canvas we'd have in the city with all the commercial advertising removed, and what we can do with that and having to sit down and say, how do we create opportunities for communities and individuals and nonprofits and artist groups to express themselves? Imagine if public space had images that actually made you think, right? Is that too much to ask and feel good about the city you live in? Imagine if all the video billboards at Dundas Square were transmitting the videos that all the kids at Ryerson next door are designing every day in class. That would be amazing. So. We can do this, it sounds pie in the sky. Sao Paulo removed thousands of billboards. It's completely billboard free. The Plateau Borough in Montreal has banned all billboards and they're in court right now trying to get all existing ones taken down. I've started a new group, it's called Scenic Toronto. The website is scenic.to. I have a sign up form right here. With your help, we can reclaim our visual environment, make our public spaces feel like home. Thank you. Yeah.